Welcome, everyone. My name is Don Chiefelbein, who, along with my father, seven brothers, their wives, five nephews, and their wives, operate Chiefelbein Farms, a large diversified farming operation in Kimball, Minnesota. I also serve as a volunteer leader as the vice president of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Tonight, I am pleased to welcome you to part two of our Cattlemen's Webinar four-part series focusing on beef cattle mineral nutrition. We are proud to be working with several industry leaders to bring you the latest on this topic. As a participant, your line will be muted, but feel free to type in questions in the question box on your screen during the webinar and at the end of the presentations, we will get to as many of those as time will allow. If you have trouble with your technology, or if you're joining us only for the audio, the webinar is being recorded and it will be available for viewing in a few days at ncba.org. Just look for the producer tab on the website. Now I'd like to thank our sponsor for this webinar, Provima, a division of Cargill. Now a few comments from Christy Brown, commercial beef director for Provimo. Ms. Brown, the floor is yours. Thank you, Don. Good evening, everyone. My name is Christy Brown. On behalf of Provimi, we really want to thank you for having us here tonight and letting us be a part of the Cattlemen series. At Provimi, we're always happy to partner with NCBA for events like this and really help circulate information to folks out in the industry. Cattle producers are truly at the heart of what we do at Provimi, and so we're so appreciative of this partnership and, and really excited for the good work that we have ahead of us. The webinar tonight will feature Mr. Steve Stafford, who is one of our nutritionists at Provimi. Steve, I want to turn it over to you. The floor is yours. Thanks, Christy. <clears throat> Get started here. All right, so um, appreciate everybody being here and, and uh, thank you uh, for having me uh, on, on this and thanks NCBA for putting this series together. Um, you know, mineral nutrition is something that uh, kind of gets overlooked once in a while and, and something that's uh, there's a little bit of art left to the science, so to speak. And so uh, it, it's good to be able to it's good to be able to have this series put together with nutrition last week and and, and then talking about some uh, implementation and management this week and then uh, going with reproduction and immunity uh, following in the next couple of weeks. So, again, appreciate that opportunity. So. Um, you know, based on this topic that I was asked to speak on, I was a little hesitant at first and then got to thinking more about it. And, and you know, I don't know if there's really any one right way to approach it other than create some conversation and, and hopefully generate some questions and, and maybe some review and orientation as well that uh, that we overlook uh, maybe as we get complacent and real busy in what we're doing. So, um, you know, what as I've sat through about 937 webinars in the last four months, um, I, I get this preconceived notion about titles of meetings and and what I'm going to get out of it, what content there might be, and so on and so forth. So, you know, this is kind of a broad topic, and 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 I hope that uh, our come from or direction from this is, is mainly just that to stimulate some thought and and help improve our mineral programs as we go forward. So, we're going to look at some background orientation of a feed tag. Right? Sounds pretty basic, maybe a little boring, um, but maybe what we're overlooking or not paying attention to, or, or maybe didn't even know. Um, you know, in full disclosure up front, I'm not an attorney, I'm not a regulator, I'm, I'm like you guys, I, I learn as I go, and I'm very fortunate to work with a great regulatory group, and, and I've learned a lot over the years. So, And then spend quite a bit of time looking at what affects mineral intake, how we can manage intake, you know, maybe what we're not observing or may, what we have observed and need to change as we go forward. And then, you know, how do we match that mineral to our goals? You know, is there strategic planning involved? You know, how much changing can we do and still be realistic? So. As we get started and we think about the context of evaluating a tag, you know, okay, so that sounds pretty blase, doesn't it? You know, we're gonna go evaluate feed tags. And, and actually, I think there's actually some 4-H programs where they're starting to teach kids this now, which is a great thing. But when you look at goals, you know, what does that mean? What's the goal of looking at a feed tag? Well, when you approach that, why are you there? What are you looking for? What do you hope to gain? You know, are you there from a, uh, a negative standpoint in that tags hide things? Are you there from an educational standpoint? Are you there from, I just need to gain knowledge and understand better what I'm doing. So how you approach that tag is pretty darn important as to what those goals you hope to get out of it. Um, you know, what animals, you know, what animals do you want to go search a product for? You know, are we talking about yearlings? Are we talking about heifers? Are we talking about cow-calf? 
what, what are we looking at placing this for? How, you know, do we have a goal of we want to get something that delivers an additive? Do we have a certain element that we need to focus on? So on and so forth. Probably one of the bigger things that I notice is, are we going and selecting a product off the shelf? Or are we actually trying to find a product that fits our program? You know, our, our enterprise program, our nutrition program, what, what does that have to do with our operation? So is it a product or a program approach? And then basic budgetary planning, obviously, we need to know what things cost, right? And so that helps understanding what a tag offers, what that feeding rate might be, what the additive addition might be. And then we look at, okay, we're gonna buy a ton of it. So there's this cost per ton or this cost per bag, but really when we break it down, we need to understand what our cost per head per day is, right? That's where we're gonna look at our animals efficiency and, and making our operation more efficient. Then here's kind of a newer one. And, and this is something that um, gets overlooked sometimes, unfortunately, and, and the newness is wearing off of this, but you know, last decade or so, we've had more and more programs come up. And I'm not talking about the mineral program or a nutrition program, I'm talking about a merchandising program, a marketing program. We're selling into some sort of program to obtain a premium, to obtain an export availability, whatever that may be, which is constantly changing. But understanding what's on this product that you're purchasing is important information that comes off that tag so that you're not sitting at your kitchen table with an auditor after you've already signed a contract on these calves and find out what you've been feeding disqualifies you for that program. So there, there's that part that comes up that's kind of interesting to, to uh, that we run into once in a while, let's say. You know, here's a big part of this. And, and this goes for all of us and myself included. You know, it's interesting. I have great admiration for producers. Um, you know, you all get up and your moms and, and your and your wives and your dads and your fathers and your little league coaches, but you're also the mechanic and you're the geneticist and you're the nutritionist and you're the farmer and you're the fence builder, so on and so forth. You put all these hats on every day. I do this every day, right? But if there's questions that you have about the tags and understanding that and make sure you confirm that understanding, you know, that's pretty darn important and a peace of mind for you that you're, you're helping make the right decision or that you can evaluate things as you go forward. But understanding that source of that information is pretty valuable too, right? And so that source, whether that be a feed store, whether that be a feed representative, your nutritionist, your veterinarian, understanding where that information and your questions being answered is coming from, then you form that trust. And that trust in that source is pretty darn important because if you got a source that you trust, now you've got some value. And this works both ways. It has to be a two-way street for that to actually generate value for that proposition. And I know that's kind of getting out in the weeds, but nonetheless, that's a pretty important part of understanding what we're going to uh, approach and doing. So we look at the basic foundation of a feed tag. The feed tags, and again, I'm not a regulator or an attorney, but the feed tags are, are designed and standardized by the Association of American Feed Control Officials. And when I say design, that the standard design of it, okay? And and this the AFCO is, is made up of state and federal people, as well as industry and consumer members as well, is my understanding. I've never been to one of their board meetings. I've never attended anything like that. This is just what I've learned from over the years. Their primary goal, and I quote, is safeguard the health of man and animal, unquote. And, and when you think about that, that basically covers what we really need to establish. There's some other side parts there that are important, but, but as, a, as an industry trying to take a product to a consumer that we want repeat buyers on, that we want to provide something with value, that, that's pretty darn important. So that consistent guidance of the regulation across the industry in respect to free trade as well as feed safety, that's pretty darn important, right? So this provides a standard for the consumer to select and, and allows them to understand the means of, of the product and appropriate safe use of that product for their animals, okay? That's kind of the basis of where that comes from. And, and their website's there, you can access and they've got great information on the website. <coughs> Excuse me. So the next thing you look at that can be kind of daunting is, you know, you look at this tag and it's got all these units on it and if you're looking at a feed additive or a drug level, you might think, oh my gosh, there's all this math we got to do. And, and you know, even doing it all the time, there's certain seasonality things. It's like, okay, I got to reacquaint myself with how this looks, so on and so forth. And, and luckily the layouts stay the same. It's just putting everything in perspective. Dr. Hansen did a great job last week reminding us that minerals occur in small requirements, okay? And relatively speaking, you know, they're consumed and delivered in small amounts too. So we got all these things that we're going to measure in really small quantities that have pretty big impact, you know, especially over time in the results of what we want to see in our operations as far as a nutritional program. So this per perspective is important to keep in mind as we go through and we look at all these units. You know, holy cow, this is kind of daunting maybe, 
But by the same token, we look and we see percentages. We deal with percentages in our life almost every day. So what's a percentage? It's a concentration or a proportion, right? It's a part divided by the whole times 100. So we have something of 100, okay? A part per million, it's abbreviated PPM. It equals one in a million, right? Here in the United States, we don't always deal with the metric system very well, but, but a part per million is the same thing as a milligram per kilogram, okay? And so when we're converting some of these things, trying to understand quantities versus concentration of what animals intake is, these things are pretty important. I use per pound, international is per pound of feed. Sometimes you'll see it in different literature pieces as KIUs, okay, which just basically represents a factor of a thousand. This is what we label our vitamins in. And, and that KIU conversion is if you had 450,000 IUs per pound of vitamin A, a KIU would be 450. So 450 times a thousand is 450,000. That's all that is. Nothing to get concerned with or excited about. A lot of times our drugs or additives are labeled in grams per ton, sometimes milligrams per pound, but a lot of times gram per ton. So here we are, we're taking the metric system and we're combining it with a US ton, okay? 2,000 pounds, so grams per ton. Pretty darn straightforward. Why is this important? We gotta remember that animals eat quantities, they don't eat concentrations, okay? So what do I mean by that? So if we have a cow that eats three ounces of a mineral that's 2,000 parts per million of copper, okay? That's the concentration, 2,000 parts per million of copper. One cow eats three ounces, another cow eats four ounces. They're eating the same product. That product has the same concentration of copper, but one's eating more copper, more milligrams of copper per day than the other cow is, okay? Yeah, we can go into why they're doing that. that that's a whole other conversation. The idea is that animals eat quantities, not concentrations. It's understand we, we have to understand both so we can get to the answers we need to to get to the direction we're going, okay? So the other thing to keep in mind about quantities is a lot of dosages of additives um, are sometimes based on a per head, per day basis, or they're based on a per 100 pounds of body weight, for example. And so it's understand it's important to understand that concentration, taking that to a quantity so we can apply it on those animals and understanding what our feeding rate needs to be. So here's a basic tag layout, okay? This is the basic structural design, you will, of a mineral tag, all right? Basic brand name, the product name, you get into the purpose statement, it describes what that's for, and then as you start adding a drug, there's gonna be a drug guarantee, and I'll show you some examples of that here in a second. So then we get in the guarantee analysis. We got calcium, phosphorus, salt, magnesium, potassium. Okay, these are all what we would consider macro minerals for the most part, salt's not necessarily a mineral, but it, they're all listed in percentages, okay? We get down to copper, selenium, zinc, and then vitamin A. These are the bare minimum requirements on guarantee analysis for mineral tag. Some states will have different requirements there as far as minimum goes. Some companies will offer more information than this, okay? Now, when we go down, we look in the ingredient section, we can see that there are other ingredients that are involved in this product that aren't on the guaranteed analysis. So just because they're not in the guaranteed analysis doesn't mean that they're in the product, right? So just because it's on the tag doesn't mean it's not in the bag, all right? And so when we look at that and you think of that combination of, okay, how am I gonna get all the information off this tag that I need? This is when you go back to that source and trust of, you might need to ask some questions about, okay, I, I'm missing something here. Can you help me figure this out? And, and because it's not straightforward sometimes, and it's not that it's not meant to be straightforward, it's just some of this stuff doesn't have to be in the guarantee analysis. So then we go through, we see use directions. There's gonna be precautionary and warning statements, particularly if there's a drug involved up top, and I'll show you an example of that in just a second. Then you see the responsible party's name, there might be lot number information on here, data manufacturer, every tag's a little bit different that way. Then we get down to the unit or quantity measurement. And see, this one says uh, 50 pounds, but then also has 22.67 kilograms next to it. That's how we have to transfer ourselves with the rest of the world. And so there's certain products you'll see labeled as 25 kilogram bags, not necessarily mineral products in the United States, for example, but other additive type products, okay? And so it'll be converted the other way just because again, this is United States type of thing. All right, so this is the basic foundation what these tags look like. So when we take a tag, and this has been genericized, if you will, ABC Feed Company, XYZ products, so on and so forth, from Timbuktu USA. But nonetheless, the tag is, is, is a real tag, okay? <clears throat> and so when you look at this, first thing I see is, okay, it's a medicated tag. So is this what we're after? You know, is this one of those things that we approach this tag to look for. You know, is this one of our goals, so to speak? We got 1.4 grams per pound of chlorotetracycline in here. Great, I go down, look at the FOSS level, calcium level, going down, looking at all the trace minerals, the vitamins, start overlooking the ingredients, make sure it's got everything I want in it, anything catches my eye in there, okay? Does this, 
you know, meet what I'm after. We look at the feeding directions, they're pretty straightforward. Any warning statements, now we see where that cautionary statement comes in because there's a drug now up in the drug proclamation box up there. And so that we just need to understand, it says there's a withdrawal here, no withdrawal, um, you know, except for the, and we can't use it in veal calves, right? So when we look at that and we make sure that we're in that program, remember our marketing program, we gotta make sure we can feed this product if, if feeding an antibiotic is a concern, okay? So that's where that all comes in. You notice down in the bottom right-hand corner, there's a little seal there and it's very hard to see, but it says certified safe feed, safe food. So this is the third party, basically an auditing that, that feed companies can participate in and they come through and, and they basically do an outside audit and say that you're manufacturing your ingredients, your record keeping, everything's kind of up to par, right? And that it's similar to in human supplements, if you're familiar with the USP emblem on human supplements. It's not the same program, but a similar program is for what they're doing as far as evaluating everything that's on the tag says on the tag, it's in the bag, okay? That's basically what you're looking at accomplishing there. So here's a look at another tag. So again, right off the bat, okay, this has got a drug in it. So we got meninsin in here, and this is labeled in grams per ton, okay? A shortcut on this, if you're worried about the math on this, is if you got something that's labeled in grams per ton, you divide it by two and you got milligrams per pound all of a sudden. So if you're looking on delivering a certain amount of milligrams per head per day, that just helps you get to that step a lot quicker. So grams per ton divided by two equals milligrams per pound. So we're looking down through the guarantee analysis, and this one looks a little different. We've got a minimum and a maximum on selenium. So earlier I mentioned that states can vary on what their regulations are. So we actually have these guys come in and say, look, wherever this product's being sold, the state says you have to have minimum max on selenium. Nothing's changed. Chances are the formulation is the same or anything. It's just listed different in the guarantee analysis. So again, we got the warning statements down below. Those are important to read through and understand what you've got going on and everything else down below that as far as labeling goes, it stays the same. So what about highlights of some of these ingredients, okay? Most ingredients have an official definition by AFCO. Not all ingredients do. And so sometimes you gotta get special permission to use an ingredient definition in your ingredient section in your tag. That doesn't mean that it can't be used as an ingredient, it just means that there's not a definition on the book, okay? But most of them have definitions, they've got numbers associated in the feed library, so on and so forth. So when they get listed in the ingredient section of the tag, they should be listed in descending order of quantity by weight not by concentration of nutrient that they're representing, but by quantity of weight of each ingredient. The other thing that you'll notice on, and you'll see this in your pet food tags, you'll see this in horse tags, but you'll see collective terms versus individually named terms, okay? And so what we mean by that is collective terms could be grain products or grain byproducts. Same thing with protein, protein products, protein byproducts. Individually named or gonna be each ingredient's gonna be individually named in that list. Now. There's a, an exception in there that they can't be both. So you can't have corn in there and grain byproducts at the same time. It's gotta be one or the other, right? Now there's states may vary on the regulations on this too, as far as what they require. And, and you'll see that in some examples I'll give you here in a second. Why am I telling you this? It seems, it seems you know, obscure, right? But when you're looking for ingredients through there and, and you notice that you've been buying this product, but it's been changing, if they're individually named ingredients and it's changing, then you know you might need to go back to that source and say, hey, I've got problems with intake, you know, I've got problems with cows, you know, not cleaning up, whatever this case may be. That, that's why I'm bringing this up, okay? So when you look at this tag, here we go. Standard tag says processed grain byproduct. Nothing wrong with that. That doesn't mean anything's changing the formula. It just means that's how they choose to label it and they're allowed to do so legally. All right. So the next example is now we got corn gluten feed. But this is also that tag that had the minimum maximum on selenium. So more than likely where this product is being sold, that state's requiring them to change their guarantee analysis and also change the ingredients, the way it's listed, okay? Again, doesn't mean the formula's changed, just means that's what you're gonna see different on the tag. So if you start studying tags and looking through and see these differences, some of these things are gonna show up. Not meant to throw you off, it's just what, what is allowed. So here's the other couple things I'll mention. The quality ingredients can't be printed in the ingredient section either. This is something I just learned recently. So you can't have grade A some byproduct. The example AFCO gives is grade A whey, for example. Or you can't have number two corn, for example. You can have whey or you can have corn, but you can't put any ingredient specification on that. So why I listed this is because it's interesting. Again, you know, as we proceed through time here, it become more and more, um, we run into these things more and more often. So the interesting part of this 
uh, quality part is that you can put organic in front of an ingredient. So I gave the example of organic barley. So if that organic, if that barley that's being used in the product is an or certified organic barley, you can label as organic barley. All right. Here's the thing that people are getting hung up on is just because it says organic barley in the ingredient section, that does not mean that the product is organic. So the barley that's in your mineral, if you have barley in your mineral, for example, or barley in your green supplement or whatever, it can be organic barley, but that doesn't mean that your supplement is organic itself, okay? So don't wanna spend all the time there, but that, that is something that has created some issues. So as we go along here and we think about, okay, intake's important, right? Intake is king, dry matter intake's king. I know that's what all of us in the nerd herd, we all talk about, but when we start talking about nutrients and effectiveness of nutrients, dry matter intake is king. If you can't get in the animal, then we can't worry about absorption and interrelationship or anything else. We gotta get in the animal. So what ingredients influence that voluntary intake of a mineral product, particularly a free choice mineral product? You know, what environmental factors? How about biological items? And, and what are we doing from a management standpoint that we could be impacting intake, whether that be on the plus side or negative side, right? So when we think about ingredients, the important thing to note with ingredients effect on intake is it can increase intake or it can actually decrease intake. So we need to understand what the amount of ingredient is, what the ingredient is, and what our result is, because there's environmental factors that come into play here as well. The common ones that get picked on, talked about, that we hear about in general conversations is salt, phosphorus, and magnesium. Salt, phosphorus, and mag are commonly mentioned as ingredients that we can, you know, affect intake typically. So with that being said, some of our additives also and their associated carriers can affect intake both positively and negatively as well. Some of the additives are designed to actually limit intake so they improve feed efficiency, right? Some of our additives have a lot of carrier that has a lot of organic matter to it. So it adds palatability, it adds, you know, taste maybe, it adds so on and so forth, we'll talk about in a second. But you need to look at what happens there, we can actually increase or decrease intake. And if we're not aware of that, we're gonna do that with these products, then we're gonna have a problem if we don't compensate for it. Dr. Hansen did a great job last week talking about magnesium and grass tetany and how we have problems with consumption there and palatability, so on and so forth. You know, we see the same thing with salt levels and, and phosphorus levels as well. Again, that's interreacted. All these things are tied together, but interreacted with some environmental influences as well. So when we look at physical characteristics of an ingredient, this can be important as well. So the presentation of the product to the animal, right? So when we present it to the animal, if the particle size is off, and that affects the uniformity of mixing, that affects how the product stays uniformly mixed during transport, that affects how it looks and tastes to the animal when they get their heads inside the feeding station, you know, but there's also maybe some environmental resilience of a product based on particle size. You know, we have, there's products out on the market now that have weatherability applied to them. There's um, other products that are put different particle sizes together so, so that they're more uniformly represented so that intake becomes more consistent and so that it weathers better, okay? <clears throat> Here's an example. And, and so here, here's a product and you look from the right hand side of the screen moving left you look at that outside layer and it's pretty uniform you know it looks like it's pretty good cow comes in likes it pretty good today pretty good tomorrow pretty good next day all of a sudden we get to the segregation part you know maybe those are chunks of salt maybe it's chunks of magnesium maybe it's chunks of phosphorus whatever it may be whatever it is might be an, uh, an anti-intake indicator for that animal so she comes back and she says yeah that didn't go so good so she might go away for a day two days, three days, a week, who knows? But nonetheless, because of that separation right there, we may have caused an intake problem. So now we're away from our consistency. Okay, so we kind of get off into the weeds and a little bit of that stuff, but there's things that affect this that we maybe don't think about or that we don't account for. And, you know, oftentimes we'll get, hey, our cows are up and down on intake. And yes, we're keeping it out for them and, you know, know the feed's good and so on and so forth. So it might be a product issue instead of an environmental and management issue. We think about odor of products. You know, what can change that odor? Maybe we put something there and that enhances the odor. Um, you know, you open a bag of mineral and boy, that really smells good. You go and open another bag of mineral or you're over helping a neighbor or a friend or whatever, man, that doesn't smell so good. Or it's been out for a while or it's been in the barn for a while. Maybe it has an oil or a fat additive to it and it's gone rancid. <clears throat> the animal's olfactory senses are, are far greater than ours and, and not even, limited to when they're up close to a product, but when they're distant from a product as well. And I don't know we completely understand all how that works yet, but we do know that some of those things are attractants and limiters as well, okay? Same with the taste. 
we can add flavor enhancers, right, to get intake to come up if we need to. Um, one of the common ones that you hear out in the field a lot is dried molasses, and, and it does work. You know, there's other things that are in there that are much more concentrate that can affect the, the taste, the gustatory system, the response of the animal. You know, so there's a lot of things in there that go up and down that we need to keep in mind. So here's the big one that comes up quite often is, is the ingredient of salt. You know, do have, and not to go against what Dr. Hansen talked about last week, she covered the nutrition part very well, but do cattle have a requirement for salt? We talk about it like they do. We talk about it like it's a nutrient, you know. Cattle don't specifically have a requirement for it. One of the things when we talk about inherent knowledge of, of what the animals need from a mineral, you know, cattle do a pretty good job balancing their salt intake, if you want to call it that, but they don't have a specific requirement for that. Is salt a nutrient? Technically, no. By definition, no. However, cattle do have a salt, uh, re sodium requirement. Some would argue they have a chloride requirement that goes along with it to maintain certain balances in metabolism, which is completely open for discussion, and, and I think we're learning more about that every day. Nonetheless, we all know that salt can affect intake, good and bad, right? Not only in the supplement, but also the environment. So when we think about that increase or decrease and we say, yeah, it's both, you know, I just mentioned the environment. I think we have to differentiate whether it's all based on the feed we're offering the animal, whether it's based on alkali soils, whether it's based on high solids water. You know, there's a lot of different things that affect that, okay? <laughs> Here's when we get into some of the stuff that's really getting interesting, some of the stuff that you all as producers have observed for years and you've taught me a lot about observing you know, some of these influences, you know, their behavior and maybe even our preference, right? And so what do I mean by that? I don't know if there's a great black and white definition here, but I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. So when we take salt intake, for example, and we think about forage quality and water quality and feeder placement, and we look at what that salt intake is in the mineral supplement versus salt intake by itself, where is that behavior and preference coming from? So an example that I'll use is we have a set of cows, a larger set of cows, and, and they're in a, maybe not a real confined space, but you know, they've got plenty of ground to get around in. But they're in, a, they're in this time of year and a daily behavior of feeding. They become gregarious, they come back to water, they loaf, they eat salt, they eat mineral at the, at the water loafing area. So we've got one feeding station of salt, we got one feeding station of mineral for a bunch of cows, okay? And when I say bunch, think 250, think 400 head, I don't care. We come in and we say, okay, look at those cows there. They go over and they stand by the mineral. They must need mineral. They like mineral. We got another bunch of cows, maybe younger cows, more timid cows. They go over and stand by the salt and eat salt. They don't know that there's salt or mineral difference in one or the other. They just know that, hey, there's something in the tub. We're supposed to be eating it, but we can't get over that other tub, so we're going to eat out of this tub. That becomes a behavioral issue, in my opinion, okay, versus a preference issue where if we took and we made five or six pairs of feeding stations, so we had five or six salt tubs next to five or six mineral tubs and they're spread out so there's adequate space for these cows to all come into water at once when they go and they start eating either salt or mineral based on preference now that's a little bit different than when we're forcing them to eat them on behavior so you know do are they telling us something yeah the cows are telling us a story there that we kind of need to interpret and understand but that's the behavior preference thing we'll mention that a few more times as we go along here so and, and I'm, I'm open for learning and discussion on that because I'm still trying to figure it out after all these years. But this is something that the cows and, and a lot of great producers ha have taught me over the years. And, and, and that observation is pretty, pretty interesting when you stop and look at it. So anyway, there's also a possible training and conditioning as well. The training can start as calves. As soon as they hit the ground, that training can start as, what, as far as a mineral tub looks like, okay, or what that feeding station looks like and, and what that palatability preference is. Conditioning can happen as well. You know, we see this in times where cow herds get merged because of drought in some area and they send cows to another part of the country, or we see where you go and buy a cow herd or we bring in a bunch of cows. You know, sometimes those cows never seen mineral before and they get to your place and they think they've, you know, died and gone to paradise because they've got water and mineral and everything's wonderful. But some of that conditioning has to take place because they're not used to it. Okay, so before we get off salt thing, here's the other one that comes up a lot of times. A lot of producers will add salt to their mineral. You know, they'll get a 50 pound bag of salt and they'll get a 50 pound bag of mineral and then combine them. I just want to make sure, I know a lot of people already know this, but it just makes me feel better to get it out there. If we've got a product that's 2,500 parts copper, 4,000 zinc and 200 units of vitamin E, okay, that's the mineral product uh, amongst other things. But we come in and we add 25 pounds of salt or we add 50 pounds of salt or we add 100 pounds of salt to that because we think they're eating too much mineral because the mineral is too expensive and we want to cheapen it up. 
whatever the reason may be, there may be legitimate reasons, okay? But whatever the reason may be, we need to understand what this does to nutrient intake. And so it's important to note the total intake of the mix, the final mix. How much are they eating of this salt and, and mineral mix together, even if the mineral's got salt in it? But the important thing to note from a nutrient quantity standpoint is you go in, you mix a 50 pound bag of salt, a 50 pound bag of mineral, and this sounds really simple, but you'd be surprised how many times it shows up in practice that this isn't accounted for, that we've now cut that copper concentration in half. So if they were eating four ounces of mineral before and they were having consuming that 2,500 part per million product, now they're eating half of that amount, even if they're still eating four ounces, right? They'd have to eat eight ounces of that final product to get the same amount of copper, right? So one of my teammates, bless her heart, she says, you know what, that table's really confusing. Let's look at a picture. And so put this in a chart form, took the vitamin E off just because it's a small number and you get the idea because we're still just trying to illustrate a picture. But this gives you a visual idea of how far we're diluting that concentration down. So on the left side of the graph are the y-axis representing parts per million of either copper or zinc. And you look in, in these different bars are represented by whether it's straight mineral, it's mineral plus 25 pounds of salt, mineral plus 50. Granted, I understand there's some little rounding areas with total volume, but nonetheless, you get the idea of the dilution factor that's taking place here. So that's something to keep in mind as you look at adjusting intakes with salt. So what about our intake from an environmental standpoint? So how does the environment, if, there's all kinds of things that come into play when we use the word environment, right? There's negative connotations, obviously, and, and, and those of us that are in the biological system all the time, we have an equation that's genotype plus environment equals phenotype, right? So what all is this environment? In this case, I'm going to relate it to different parts of the country, right? And, you know, it depends on where you're at. There's going to be all kinds of environmental impacts. Only you know this. You know your country better than I do. You know your country better than most anybody. And so these are examples to apply, right? They're not meant to be black and white examples. But when you think about this, think about topography. What about distance? You know, are we, do we have adequate feeding stations out based on the distance these cows are covering? You know, we get to certain parts of the country, these cows don't walk a quarter mile a day to cover everything they need. We get to other parts of the country, they might water every second or third day. Who knows? And so, you know, is distance appropriate for what you expect to get out of your mineral intake program? Maybe we need to go to a different delivery system. What about slope? You know, we don't think much about slope, but cows, are they really prone to, maybe they like a south facing slope in the wintertime, right? That's a good place for them to stay because it's warmer possibly in certain northern climates. Maybe the slope is too steep for them to get up to and they're not going to go frequent that part of the pasture. And so your intake up there is going to be less. Maybe that you know, it is effective on how those animals distribute themselves grazing, but also what's happening to the supplement intake, particularly in this case, mineral intake. What about temperature zones within a pasture or an, an area or part of your ranch? You know, is it possible like this time of year, maybe something on top of a knoll where there's a breeze that keeps the bugs down and keeps the temperature down, those cows are going to spend more time there. They're happier. They might eat more mineral there. Same thing goes in the wintertime. Do you want to keep it in a warmer place or a cold, shady place where the wind's blowing? Everybody's got all these different environmental concerns. Uh, I shouldn't say concerns, factors to, in, to incorporate into what their program needs to look like. And these are things that we're adjusting intake on, and sometimes we don't even think about it. So what else does the environment do to our intake? You know, there's some great pictures. You know, you look at, at the upper feeder, upper left corner there, and, you know, the wind is obviously blowing the mineral out of that feeder. You know, there's certain minerals that maybe hold the wind better. There's certain mineral feeders that hold, hold the, the mineral better in wind. You know, and there's certain parts of our country where we've got wind, and, and I'm not talking 20, 30 mile an hour winds either. We're talking, you know, 70, 80, 90, 100 mile an hour winds, and it's hard to think, keep things in place. The other thing, going back to the particle size, going back to some of the management, we can talk about feeding stations in a minute. Is it protecting it from moisture? Is this product setting up and getting clumped up? Is it setting up like a brick or turning into concrete? Makes great road fill, but pretty hard to get nutrients into the animals, right? So these different weather conditions create um, you know, different results with intake, not only from the standpoint of what the animals are doing, but what our management of the feeding facility or the feeding station is doing, okay? So you combine these things with management facilities and, and we get all kinds of different results with intake, but it's important to observe them and, and react to them. So an, an internal, and this is just a real basic thing, tracking mineral intake on this ranch, two-year deal, um, in South Dakota, it was a very unique situation. We were able to get to a cow herd that was completely naive. I say completely. 
mainly naive to a nutrition or a mineral program in the beginning. So they get mineral put out and like we see oftentimes overconsumption for two to three weeks, they get filled up, they start to slow down. The reason I'm showing you this graph is one is that peak in the beginning, okay? But then you go across these two years and it's real interesting how these cows, when they got used to a mineral program, you know, yeah, there's variation, but it's typically seasonal variation. And this can be dependent, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but this can be dependent on forage quality and quantity. This can be dependent on production cycle. This can be dependent on the size of the animals that we're talking about on free choice intake. But anyway, just wanted to show a two-year study, and I'll show you another one here in a minute, um, in a few minutes actually, but kind of demonstrating too, and you can put your finger on whether we're talking about environmental influences here, whether we're talking about normal cyclicity, there's a lot of different things that take place with free choice mineral intake. This is just a real general summary. This was a summary of some Midwest uh, mineral intake studies. I believe Nebraska, Colorado, Iowa, Kansas, if I remember correctly. Um, and combining, um, trying to figure out different grass species. You see three uh, warm season versus cool season grasses and, and no, you know, no assortment based on cow size or production or anything, just based on season, okay? And, and it's interesting how we see this seasonal variation. So when we start seeing some of that, we need to recognize it. Do we need to adjust product? Maybe, but we need to be aware of it as we go forward, all right? So when we look at biological effects of the animal on intake, you know, and, and you could arrange these a bunch of different ways, right? And so again, trying to simulate some thought and, and, and reflection on what we're observing here. You look at the biological effects on intake, first one that comes to mind for me is stage of production, okay? You take a, a cow, you just pull her calf off of, you put her out on some nice crop residue, put her out on a pasture you save, some regrowth on a cool season grass, whatever the case may be, her life just got really easy, right? Providing she's got some time to recover before she calves again, because as they get in later stages of desiccation, that'll change. But, you know, that stage of production, that cow, she's in good body condition, she's got good feed under, if there's no weather stress, her mineral intake might go down a little bit, you know? But think about that stage of production 30 days before that, when she still had a calf on her side, you know, and everybody's got their magical 1,250 pound cow, but they've got 600 pound calves on the side, 550 pound calves on the side, whatever the case may be. Now all of a sudden we got 1,800 pounds of animal out there instead of 1,200 pounds of animal. And so when we start calculating intakes, you know, that stage of production on, in that system is, is we got a lot more animals eating mineral than, than just the one cow, right? And so if you, if you measure it that way and do that consistently, that's fine for comparison, but do understand that typically in a lot of our country when you know, feed quality goes down, feed quantity goes down and calves get bigger, that mineral consumption is gonna start going up. So that, that's just something to be aware of, right? So that size and weight of animals falls right into that stage of production that we just talked about. But on the flip side of that, if we got a cow herd with a bunch of 1,000 pound cows and we got a cow herd with a bunch of 15, 1,600 pound cows, typically our average animal intake is gonna be a little bit greater with those larger animals, okay? Particularly if they're in the same type uh, management scenario. So that's gonna change within that production cycle. So make sure and make note of that in your notebook or as you're keeping track of mineral intake and, and planning for the future. What about the age of animals? Remember we talked about conditioning and training, you know, sometimes these younger animals, um, you know, they don't have the experience that they, the older animals do if they're turned out on say some rougher country, some poor quality feed as a whole versus younger animals that may be kept on your best pastures and still growing and, and their mineral in intakes might not be as high as what those older animals are. And, and so adjusting for that and understanding that that will change as those animals get older, that's important from you know a planning standpoint, that's important from an evaluation standpoint, but that can change their intake. We're back to the behavior and preference thing again. I'm not gonna belabor that, I think I gave that example, but when we think about how we manage that and what that animal individuality is, that becomes important in making sure that that works for you. So when I say manage that, if you're in a confined area, you can do this more so than if you're in a more expansive area. But in a confined area, if you've got overconsumption, you can actually reduce the number of those feeding stations. You might not get individual intake changes, but your average herd intake, it may go down, okay? Because there's less area for those animals to all get to. There might be some less competition, so on and so forth. On the flip side of that, you can put out more feeding stations so everybody can get to it. And on a per pasture per herd average, that intake could go up, okay? Is that important? Depends on the situation, depends on what you're doing and what your attitude is towards feeding mineral or any other supplement for that matter. 
The individuality part, this is part that's getting interesting and we need to keep our eyes on. As technology advances, and, and, and we've got some great researchers in this country that are trying to identify this more and more. What is the individual intake of mineral for these animals? The hard part for the poor researchers is finding pastures that are of similar size, that are of similar quality and similar density as far as forage production goes throughout the season. And then being able to track the individual animals. We've got some great technology systems out there that can individually track in animal intake. You know, are they perfect? Probably not, but they're a lot better than what we had with a pair of binoculars and, and estimating how many licks they took, right? Because that's how we used to do it. So when you think about that, and, and what's interesting, and, and I won't go into specific data here, but when you look at the data, there's, there's some correlation to these individual animals. Even irregardless of the pasture quality they're on or pasture quantity, the density, these two animals, if you take them for a lower quality and you move them up to a higher quality situation, the animal that ate less mineral in the lower quality situation will probably eat less mineral in the higher quality situation. So they seem to be consistent in what their individuality is. Now there's a lot of different variables that change there. So it's really hard to make that 100% correlation. But I think as technology advances and we get to understand more of that, you know, we'll probably see some identification of how that looks furthering. And so when you set your operations parameters, right, you, you're going to be bred up in the, you got 42 day breeding season, or you better get bred up, girl, or, or you're going to go be somebody else's cow. If you're going to be calving in the first 21 days of the breeding or the calving season, I need 83% of you to do that. Whatever your production parameters are, if you stick to that, and if your nutrition program is marginal, those animals that aren't voluntarily eating enough because of their individuality, they will fall out of your program eventually, or they'll fall out of your program sooner than the cow that might be eating more. Now, that's assuming we've got everything else balanced, right? So there becomes a lot of assumptions to accommodate for these variables. But something to think about as we go forward and as you're observing your cows. Okay, here's a big one. And, and, and I know you think I'm kind of being a smarty pants here, but th this is actually real. <laughs> we call this barn dooritis, right? And they can't eat what they can't get to, right? So that's the first step for management from intake is we got to present it to the animals. If we don't have it in front of them, they can't eat it. And maybe that's on purpose. Maybe that's because of a situational thing, or maybe that's just because we're not getting it done. You know, labor continues to be an issue. I have a great privilege of doing producer meetings around, and for the last several years, I've started the meetings with asking, give me your top three challenges, and, and they can be whatever they want. But without fail, one of those top three challenges every meeting is labor. And um, whether it be because the oil patch is active and everybody went to the oil field, whether it be because school's back in session, whether it be because whatever the situation, labor tends to be an issue. And um, you producers know that better than I do. And I don't know what the answer is, but even when we look at how many cows we try to put per laborer, per person, per herdsman, you know, we keep trying to expand that more cows per person, right? And so that comes into logistics management as well. So we, we combine these things and these are a challenge to keep mineral out in front of cow herds sometimes. You know, sometimes it's not a problem. Sometimes we're there checking water. Sometimes we're there, you know, moving pastures. That's, that's a great deal because we're there anyway and we can keep mineral put out. Other situations, other people's operations, they're not that fortunate. The equipment we have today, that's actually a plus, a positive. More and more four-wheelers, more and more side-by-sides. You know, I've had producers tell me they're getting more mineral put out, they're getting more water projects done, more fence fixed. You know, these things allow those types of items to happen easier. So then they happen instead of them being a challenge, right? We talk about feeding stations, you know, or, or mineral tubs, whatever you want to call them, mineral feeders. Feeding stations, management of those feeding stations is important. And, and we'll talk about that here in more detail in a second. You know, you think about a mineral product that you select to go into a TMR. We've got more and more cows getting fed with a mixer box, you know, whether they're in confinement, whether they're getting fed out on the ground, whether they're getting fed in skittable troughs, whatever that may be. The important thing is to understand that diet that's going to TMR to make sure that you have a product that can stay mixed in that diet and make sure you got a mixture that can mix the diet appropriately. Otherwise, we're cheating those cows and nutrients. OK, and we could go on and on with this topic. Here's the other one, the consistent access versus intermittent access. You know, um, in fact, I had a call today. It's, it's funny how this all worked doing this and actually had a call from customer day. But talking about overconsumption of mineral, but they only go out there once a week and they don't know what day of the week that they're out of mineral. So these cows are fluctuating up and down all the time. We have legitimate reasons for this. It might be somebody in a grazing association, it might be somebody out on public land where they can't put mineral out. So there's gonna be a certain time of the year that these cows aren't gonna have mineral in front of them. 
The interesting thing is, is cattle that typically are on this yo-yo that overconsume over a year's period of time, well, a lot of times, if they have access to an ability to make up for it, they'll actually eat more mineral than the cow has mineral in front of you. And so everybody's situation is different. Some deals are legitimate. Some of them are just because we're not doing a good job of it. But understanding that those things affect intake as well. So this whole feeding station thing about placement, you know, we, we talk about different weather factors, you know, whether it be mud, whether it be snow. Um, you know, I, I've seen cattle that go from a feed ground back into a crowd of water, but they got two foot of snow on the ground. The mineral tubs are 25 feet off the trail. They won't go to them. You move the mineral tubs back on the trail, they'll eat mineral again. You know, um, what about the safety of the placement of things? Not just for your labor, you know, but what about ice? Is there a bunch of ice around for these cows to slip on? Is there a bunch of bogs? You know, swampy ground for them to get stuck in. Is there a snake pit right there? You know, are they gonna get bit? Are there grizzly bears right there? They're gonna get ate, you know, talking about wildlife, you know, and then we got wildlife influences on intake. You got hogs in there. You know, I talk to guys every once in a while that have problems with hogs getting in the middle. You know, and once them hogs get in there and mess it up, a lot of times the cattle won't come back and see it. Birds can come in and foul a bunch of mineral feeders really quick if you let them. You know, you get a bunch of elk maybe come camped out in certain parts of the country and eat a bunch of your mineral. So not only is it affecting your intake or you mismeasuring intake, but it might be creating some other issues as well, right? So what about the number of feeding stations? We talked about that briefly, but that's important to keep managing that number of feeding stations that you have out there so that there's, you know, we can eliminate the next thing here. We're talking about behavior and preference again. Notice how that falls in several different categories. And that training and conditioning is a big deal as well. And, and so, again, we start that at a really young age or possibly. So when you think about how do you go about evaluating your, your feeding stations or your number of feeding stations? You know what? If you're in a small confined area, it's really easy to figure out, right? If you're in a large expansive area, you kind of need to know, you know, how many cows and calves you got out there, you know, how many times they're going to be around, how much country they're covering, you know, what's your cross fencing situation, what's your stock density, so on and so forth. Are we going to put it in areas that drift over? Do we want those feeders to get drifted over? Are we going to put them in areas where you have dust storms and they get blown over with sand? You know, a lot of different situations in everybody's part of the world that we need to ask ourselves those questions. Are we putting those feeding stations in the right place? Do we have enough out there? So we always get questions. You know, how many feeding stations or how many cows per feeding station? Would I like to see one per 25? Absolutely. Is that realistic? Probably not. You know, can we get by with one to 75, one to 100? Again, it depends on that expanse of the land and how those cows uh, grazing patterns are, what their feeding patterns are, um, and, and the time of the year, quite frankly. And so these are great questions we've got to ask ourselves and observe how the cattle react. Nobody knows your country better than you do. Nobody knows your cows better than you do. It's just a matter of whether you're making the observations or not. What about the opportunity and training? I, I love getting these. I got this picture this spring from a producer and, and I got a couple of videos, but Jesse told me no videos and they weren't good videos anyway. They were cell phone videos, but nonetheless. So this producer sends me this picture and he says, you know, I missed an opportunity here. He said, I got 25, 30 calves around this mineral tub. And he says, you gotta have a couple more mineral tubs out there. And so in this case, he just got done feeding cows. They're gonna go back through this gateway, back to a creek to water and they'll bed down. And they'll pick up their calves on the way through. But these calves are piled in these mineral tubs. And, and I mean, we've got pictures of calves standing in mineral tubs. And so, you know, anytime we get these calves start eating mineral, um, you know, that sure helps. But we're also training them for the future. Whether it's these heifers that stay on as developments and they come back in the cow herd on the same ranch, or whether it's the steers that go out in a yearling program somewhere, they see a mineral tub or mineral feeder, they're not so naive to it. And I know that sounds crazy, but when you start thinking about it, it makes a little bit of sense when we start making these observations. And, and then we have opportunities uh, to train these animals and, and improve intake. As far as feeders go, we've got options. Everything from commercially prepared feeders to inverted tires to old salt houses, you know, salt meal houses maybe, to use protein tubs. And I've seen hollowed out logs, I've seen pressure tanks cut in half, teat dip drums, you know, cut in half. Everybody's got a different way of putting a mineral. The important thing is getting it out and make sure it's protected from the environment as much as needed to be. And it's the right size for animals to get into that they can access. <clears throat> okay, so I know we're getting we're getting on here and, and we've covered a lot of country here and hopefully generate a lot of thought. So what about tracking record keeping? What's this got to do, Steve, with tags? What's this got to do with intake? Well, when you're monitoring is the first step, you know, and, and it, again, a little side note here, and I just had this conversation with a producer a couple of weeks ago, and, and they've got some cows that are quite a ways from their place. And he was telling me about this trail cam that they got. And I'm not a big techie guy, but 
this trail cam, they happen to be, these cows happen to be an area where they have cell service. And this trail cam they put up to monitor their water and their minerals. And when they buy the trail cam, you can get it to send your phone pictures based on time. You set the timer or it can be motion activated, but they get like three pictures a day for free or something like that. Or you can subscribe and don't quote me on the numbers, five bucks a month, you can get a hundred pictures a day or whatever. But this, this camera will actually send them pictures of how, how their water's doing. And he says they're putting their mineral by it as well. And so he knows what day of the week that they're gonna be out. So they can plan their schedule to actually go to this remote location or distant location from their home base and, and, and do this. So they're tracking and, and, and that's pretty, pretty impressive that they'll let those cows maybe dictate when they're gonna go up there and check on them as far as keeping mineral out for them. So that's just a little side note, but there's technology out there available to do this, right? And, and some of it's not expensive, some of it's become more available. Uh, these cameras, you know, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of opportunity there. So keeping product and intake records, you know, how's that gonna help? Well, that's gonna offer reflectance on product decisions going forward. You know, if we've got good records and, and what the products were during a drought, and then we go and we've got five good years and then we got drought again, we can say, what was that we were using? You know, I got that from, from, from my source and you can go back and identify that specifically, right? And you can have notes on how it was working for you. Um, there's an accounting and, and inventory management part of this, right? So the accounting part is simple. The financial part is if you buy 40 bags of mineral and 40 bags is gone from a financial accounting standpoint, that's what you did. Understanding what the intake part was, that might be more important from a shrink detection standpoint. You know, um, the inventory management kind of goes along with the accounting part. But if your guys, your labor aren't telling you you're going to run out of mineral and you run out of mineral and then you call somebody and say, hey, I need mineral tomorrow. And they're going, I can't get you mineral tomorrow. Well, then you're going to be out probably for another week or several days or whatever. So, you know, from a shrink detection, just because we put it out doesn't mean it's getting consumed, right? So if we have nutrient shortage and we've got something that's going on, like in this picture up here in the corner, you know, where a bull stepped in it, tipped it over, where the wind blew it out, something like that. If we're tracking that and we're keeping track of that from a, in our records, but also visually, we understand that maybe we're losing some mineral somewhere. I hate to bring it up and, and it's, we hear about it more and more all the time, but we have some shrink happening with haystacks disappearing and supplement tubs disappearing and cattle disappearing. We've got some two-legged shrink that takes place and uh, that's something that us as neighbors can help each other look out for. <clears throat> so there's an element to the feedback um, and, and safety portion of this, right? So if you have a program you're selling into and they need some feedback on the product that you have, you've got records of it, right? Because two years ago you sold these calves, this is what we we're feeding. If your supplier or source needs some feedback on saying, hey, what do you, what do you think of this when we change this ingredient or something? You got some feedback, you know, there. What about us from a safety standpoint? What if there's a recall of some sort? You've got this information on file. Okay, it doesn't have to be an elaborate system. We got access to phone apps, spreadsheets. There's great extension people out there that have stuff put together to help with record keeping, so on and so forth. From a nutritional standpoint, being able to overlay that product consumption, okay, the, in other words, the nutrient delivery over certain climatic and calendar variables, like we showed with some of those intake graphs. And like I said, if you have a fire event, if you have a drought event, if you have a severe winter event, if you can understand what happened there and make adjustments to your program, you might be ahead of the curve before the bad things happen. So what about matching and picking and designing a product? So we went through these tags, you know, we kind of reviewed what our management is, what our cows are doing, what our labor force is doing. You know, what about picking and designing, matching a product? You know, getting the erotic product really boils down to several things. You know, we like to make more difficult than what it probably is, right? But there's still an art to all this science. I wish science accommodated for everything, but it doesn't. So we've got to understand our goals, what we're looking for doing. What are we looking for doing for our enterprise? What are we looking to do for the animals? What are we looking to do for our environment, okay? You know, all these things come into play, right? The nutrient requirements versus nutrient availability. Dr. Hansen talked a lot about different ingredients and their availability in the animal. We need to understand what the animal's requirements are, and then we got to make sure we're getting availability into them. That all starts with intake, selecting the right product so we get the right intake to them, and then the rest we can go from there. Testing your forages and water. Okay, understanding research, taking advantage of, of some of our folks in the extension and academia world, taking advantage of your nutritionist and your veterinarian and some of your feed representatives. We've got some great people in the industry and a lot of them are very genuine and they're willing to share the information. You know, I, 
I just, I'm always amazed at, you know, how fortunate we are in this industry. It's a small industry. We've got some great people in it. And, and there's so much information out there that we can get. The tracking estimate is that's on you, okay? Um, if you got some good tracking information, you're gonna be able to estimate what your needs are going forward. That's, it's really that simple. You take the perfect product, you take the perfect information and everything. If you can't get the product, that's a problem. If you wait until last minute to get your product delivered, um, you know, that's part of that two way street of having that trust and, and source and value relationship. But product availability has got to be there, not only out to the cow, but you got to be able to get it to the ranch too. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, some of the tools. I, I, again, my teammates, I, I'm, I'm blessed with some great teammates and they help me a lot. And uh, a lot of uh, wisdom there. You know, I've got one teammate that's been in the industry 50 years and, and he teaches me something and sometimes I don't even know it. I've got other teammates that are really driven and sharp and, and they build tools like this and let me use them and and uh, you know that it's all on them so this is something that seems really simple it's a little bit more complex to build but truly really simple in concept so we took this tool and we we allowed on a monthly basis we take an animal and we we either via testing or estimate we figure out what the forage nutrients are we figure out what the supplement nutrients are we figure out what the mineral nutrients are we estimate consumption you know, uh, the best we can based on our knowledge and experience. And we go in and we lay this out in this tool. This happens to be a line for phosphorus, okay, for this animal and or for this situation, this group of cattle. The amount of grams of phosphorus per head per day is over on the left-hand side on the y-axis. The months are on the x-axis down below. This line I'm showing right now is a supply line, okay? That's what's in this deal. The requirements are right here in this line I just put up on the screen. So we can see that the supply is overdone part of the year and it's underdone part of the year. Okay, then we can take and look at what are we looking at for doing as far as do we have some real safety concerns here? Yeah, probably not, but close. Are we spending some times of the year where we're below where we want to be? Yeah, maybe. You know, and so we can look at this from this is from a foster standpoint. And this is to draw a picture of some of these tools and, and how useful they can be in doing picking a product you know can we feed the same product year round yeah you probably can but are you missing holes yeah probably missing some holes are you overdoing it somewhere and losing some efficiency yeah you're probably doing that somewhere so it's it's real interesting to go out and pick a couple products that fit maybe what you're doing and get you closer to where you need to be so this is a visual tool that we use and, and it's uh it's been a lot of fun to play with so here's the key from a, a standpoint of getting it done be realistic Okay, sometimes perfection versus practicality, that can get in the way of getting it done. And that's, you know, something that we get caught up in a lot. But nonetheless, it's more important to get it done probably than get it per perfect. Continuously improve your program, no matter what it is, whether it's mineral supplementation, protein, body condition, continuously improve your program. Okay, that's how we get better. What about water? This is one that gets forgot about a lot because one, it's hard to measure. But one, it's very important. Why did I select this picture? I select this picture because we got green growing forage here that's really high in moisture, okay? We've got a pond here that we can talk about. Now, irregardless of what your water source is, whether it's live water, well water, municipal water, whatever the case may be, all these water sources might or might not change. So we take live water, it's gonna change throughout the year, year to year. You take well water, eh, it might change, but over time it might change, but probably not as much so as live water, right? You take a surface water such as this pond, it's gonna change every year, right? So we need to understand what those water sources are, what the availability, what the quality is. You know, you take something like this pond, we got the dilution effect. As that pond goes down over the summertime, everything's gonna become more concentrated, right? Whether it's good or bad. Right now we're dealing with locally blue-green algae bloom. So that's not a water quality concern from a Nutrient standpoint, but it sure tips them over pretty quick when they get into it. All right, so strategic planning. Okay, is there a need for that? Absolutely, there's a need for that because we got to be able to meet our goals. We got to be able to plan, right? So the more information you have to make those choices, the better. You know, your plan's got to be implementable, right, to get it done. So that human factor, we don't talk about it much, but there's always the human factor involved. That's critical. If we can't get that human part straightened out, then possibly our success is going to be limited, right? So that human factor is critical to keep that in mind in, in the entire step of the process. Are we gonna go over supplement at times? Absolutely. Just because we can't adjust every day for every animal, for every pasture, for every situation. Are we gonna under supplement at times and require on body stores? Yes. Dr. Hansen did a great job last week talking about stores of some of the trace minerals. 
Can we take advantage of that? Absolutely. Sometimes we have to because of our situation. Sometimes we need to because we got to get the corn planted and we can't get mineral put out. Whatever the case may be, these things are going to happen throughout the time. The more we're ahead of it, the more we can stand from it. Okay. Is there a need for strategic planning within the operation ahead of time and during it and afterwards? Yeah. So these environmental changes that we talk about, you know, they're going to happen from year to year. And we've got optional products to account for that, whether that be changing the basic standard foundation of calcium phosphorus, whether that be additives, right? Maybe we won't look at flight control. Maybe we won't look at a wormer. We won't look at an ionophore. Whatever the case may be, those things might change from year to year depending on what you're doing with your animals. You know, are there places in your operation that differ? You know, from mom's place, when we bring the cows back home, when we go across the river, you got to be aware that sometimes these things, these operations, right, they're situational and dynamic. You got to keep that in mind. So a, a little graph here I told you I was going to show you a little while ago. Um, this is a Montana intake deal. Real basic, again, just tracking mineral intake. This is a, a really a good operation in some short gas country. We go from one year, on the left side of the graph is one year, okay? This was really wet, lush year. We had great feed year. Um, these animals banged along, kind of what you would expect seasonally, not real big animals. And, and this guy, he was a hand. He says he's not a cowboy. He says he's a grass farmer, but, but he was a good rancher. He's no longer with us anymore. On the right side of the, this is the next year, okay? We get over here, you notice we get to May and June, Everything's banging along. All of a sudden, we get to June, the rain shuts off. And this country dries up, and the feed goes down, the quality goes down, the quantity goes down. The calves continue to grow because the cows are milking their body condition off of them. We get up there, we get out September, October, and they're up to almost three quarters of a pound of mineral a day. Wean the calves, they immediately drop almost four ounces. So, nonetheless, here's the situation, right, where we got environment, we've got management. You know, would we have done this differently if they weren't on the trial, probably, if you were the operator, right? especially now, which we know. So this was something that was done, oh, what, you know, 20 something years ago. And so we know a lot more than we did back then. But nonetheless, I want to show this from an environmental standpoint from year to year. All right, so you're about done with me here. Parting thoughts and reminders. Big one, understand your goals. Your operation has goals, okay? Time, finances, legacy planning, so on and so forth. Those animals are part of that operation. What goals do you have for those animals? What goals do you have for the product to serve your animal's needs? Okay, when you're talking about a mineral program, there's a lot of choices there, but that consistency is pretty darn important to pay off. Okay, we think of, we think of that mineral as kind of oil in the engine, right? We're, you know, we want to use it to improve weaning weights. We want to improve it reproductive efficiency. We want healthier animals to get to the feedlot, get started on feed faster. All these things are important and, and add to the efficiency of the operation. Don't be intimidated by the tags. You know, use your source and your trust. Ask, learn, and review that information as much as you need to. There's no shame in asking questions. We all got them, um, and we're learning more new stuff all the time. Implement a program versus a product approach. If I can encourage you to one thing is think of your nutrition as a program. Don't think of it as a product, okay? Um, it's important to look at the product, evaluate it financially, nutritionally, so on and so forth. Nonetheless, think of it as part of your program. Okay, there's one constant. And if in the last four months we haven't all realized that in this society we're living in, change will continue, okay? So be prepared for the change, learn from what we're doing and keep going forward. You know, a mineral program is real easy to track. It's a little harder maybe to design and implement, but it, we know a lot more about it than we did 30 years ago, all right? Learn from your cows and your people. You know, when I say your people, I don't mean just your labor, I mean your neighbors. We, there's so many great producers in this country that we can learn stuff from, maybe good and bad, and maybe it works for them in this situation, but nonetheless, we can learn from it, right? And, you know, think about how your environment's going to affect that management of that program too, right? So learn from your history, understand your country. Nobody knows your country better than you do, all right? It might not be perfect, okay, but it's got to be functional for you to see the results. Keep in mind, cows have a long generation interval. So we do a cow today, we might see the results two years from now, maybe three years from now. You look at the great gestational nutrition work that's being done, we might have influences for three filial groups out there based on what we're, how we're managing these cows now. So it'll be interesting to keep an eye on that. The source trust and value thing, find people that you, you trust, you know, build those relationships. You know, I, again, I, I'm lucky to have great relationships with people in academia, you know, customers I've been doing business with for 20 years. We just, we have a lot of good genuine people in our industry. We're lucky to be in this industry. Here's something else, parting thought, whether it be your mineral program, whether it be how you're marketing your cattle, whatever. 
efficiency is critical for the success of our industry. All right, so I'm done. Christy, I think this is back to you. All right, thank you, Steve. Thank you, attendees, and everyone uh, who joined here this evening for tonight's presentation. The partnership that we have with NCBA is truly about being able to bring the latest and most relevant information to producers. And Mr. Stafford, I think you did exactly that tonight, so thank you. Uh, as we move into our question and answer session, go ahead and type your questions into the chat box. And I'm actually going to turn it over to Jesse Fulton, the Director of Producer Education with NCBA to moderate tonight's Q&A. Jesse? Thank you, Christy, and thank you, Steve. Um, and I'd also like to thank Provimi uh, for helping sponsor this webinar and help bring our producers this great information. Um, so let's get to your questions. Uh, just type in your questions over in the chat box on the side, and we'll try to get through those. Um, Steve, uh, just to go ahead and get us kicked off, uh, I don't know how much you really looked in, into some of the VFD stuff that really came out uh, a couple years ago. But when you when you feed medicated mineral, uh, what determines if you need a VFD or not? Well, first of all, defining the medication. So typically, most a lot of medicated minerals going to be based around chlorotetracycline, and that is one that requires a VFD. So defining what you mean by medication is the first step, and um, most of that stuff's fairly available now. Most of the vets that you work with, your consulting veterinarian, um, will have information, and a lot of times they have it on their phone right there with them on site. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and then uh, you might have mentioned this, and I might have just missed it, but when it comes to cows all being gathered around the, the mineral lick, is that more of a, a social thing that cows are doing, or you know, do the cows know when they need to head on over and take them a lick of mineral? So that that's a really good question, and and man, from an observational standpoint, I think that's really hard to determine. But there's certain times a year that that cows are driven to consume mineral, you know, and everybody's situation is different. But there's certain times of the day when those cows are gathering up, and and they're there. They might be licking on each other. They might be swatting flies off of off of each other. Or there's certain time of the year where their grazing periods are much shorter. So we get into shorter days, colder nights. And they might spend more time laying down bedded down to stay warm and so their schedule becomes a little more hectic like ours does and so they're getting to the feed ground they're getting the water they're getting mineral and they're moving on to stay warm they're not going to stand around like they might in the summertime for example and so then some of that too depends on where those mineral feeders are placed if it's an enjoyable place to be breezy cool so on and so forth they might spend a lot more time there so it becomes more of a social thing all right um, how are we designing mineral products that are three to four ounces uh, consumption per day per head um, if we're feeding that mineral free choice? Um, I'm not sure I understand that. So how are we des designing a mineral product if it's to be three to four ounces per head per day um, at that rate of consumption if we're feeding it? Uh, free choice so how do we ensure that they're getting that much <laughs> okay yeah and so that's where the dry matter intake thing is, is such a big deal so um that's why we have so many different influences on intake and that's why it's hard to say that we're going to get that but i don't i don't think any of us are going to tell you that we're going to nail every animal at four ounces ahead a day part of that formulation comes from selenium standards and what we're allowed to put in there as far as maximum selenium levels go Part of that comes from, you know, history and, and knowledge of what animals will eat. You know, part of what we're seeing with, um, you know, my colleagues and I have talked about this quite a bit is our modern animals, our, our intakes are changing. Uh, maybe not so much on mineral supplements, but overall, our, our modern animals are becoming quite the machine. And, um, you know, so therefore some of that intake changes. As far as the design goes, that's based on some history. That's based on different limiters that we're using. You know, again, based on historical knowledge, whether it be salt, whether it be phosphorus, um, you know, are we going to get four ounces of cow in there every day? Probably not in a free choice setting. Those cows are going to be some cows that that eat three quarters of a pound a day, and there's going to be other cows that don't even come to the mineral trough. And so it's based on averages, and and that's why I spent a little bit of time there talking about individuality. All right, you know, besides mineral supplementation, a lot of producers are also putting out um, protein or energy tubs. Um, so if a producer is putting that out separately, how can that influence mineral intake? 
That, that's actually a really great question. And so there's going to be some variables based on what the forage supply like is and what their their area that they're covering, you know, a more dense area, fewer acres versus larger acres. But so <clears throat> when when you talk about whether it's a protein supplement or energy supplement, chances are the, the quantity of intake of either one of those supplements is going to change what their quantity and quality of their basal diet that they're consuming. So when these animals get their dry matter intake fulfilled, and if they're getting some of these other things that they don't, if they're satisfied by what's going in their basal diet and their energy and protein supplement, and they don't have anything that's driving them to say, hey, we're short on something, their free choice mineral intake is probably going to go down. Now, there could be other elements that are in the protein and energy supplements that are also satisfying some of that. And it's much more palatable, that organic matter, than what it's going to be in, in a free choice mineral, for example, okay? Now, we see the same thing with mineral intake. You go from a stack of good hay to a stack of crappy hay, and their mineral intake will change overnight, you know, just because of what their basal diet is fulfilling them in. Now, is there all kinds of neuroreceptors and, and hormonal feedbacks and other things that, that have been studied and that we're understanding more as time goes on? Yeah, and, and I don't know what all those are off the top of my head, but, but that's a really good question, how other supplements affect that. All right. And, you know, you brought up salt and using salt um, for, you know, to manage intake. So should producers be using salt to manage intake or should they just be using, you know, to, to limit how much they're consuming or do we need to use that to get them to consume it? Uh, it works. It works both ways and depends on everybody's situation there. Again, if you start adding it to an existing mineral product, you're going to start diluting it. So understanding what the total intake of the salt and mineral combination is, that's important to understand how much nutrients you're getting into them. You know, do you need to draw them to more in mineral intake? Maybe you change that salt level. A lot of times mineral supplements that have lower salt levels will have higher phosphorus. <clears throat> they might have other additives into them or less desirable uh, ingredients in there. And so they're just not as palatable. And, and so sometimes just because it has a lower salt level in it, they're not eating much of it. It might have not have anything to do with that salt. It might have to be something else that's influencing that intake. And so maybe you need to add salt to it. Maybe you need, need to add some molasses to it to get that intake up. Um, as far as year in and year out, if you find a mineral supplement that you've got adjusted for your salt level, your phosphorus level, and you're happy with whatever that inconsistency is from day to day, but you're averaging that, say, three and a half ounces, for example, you're getting that in them based on the salt that you're getting into them through your mineral supplement, then you're probably good unless you want to put some salt blocks out there or something if you think they're bored. The thing is, you got to remember that boredom and that that density of an area that they're in can really drastically influence that. Would we be better off using dried molasses or? It, again, it just depends on the situation. Understanding what your water source is. If you got water that's really high in total dissolvable solids, getting them to eat more salt probably is not going to happen, right? Yep. If you're out on a chunk of ground that's really high in alkali and your forages are really high alkali, chances of getting them to eat more salt probably isn't real likely. And so you're going to have to deal with something that's more of an organic matter enhancer. Hence dried molasses. Okay. Um, back to that protein and energy question. Uh, just as a follow up, would it be better off for a producer to purchase um, more of a supplement that, you know, a protein energy supplement that includes the mineral package? <laughs> um, so if you can find one that delivers what you want, um, you know, there, there's getting to be more and more of these protein supplements that actually have, um, and, you know, we do it as well within our company that actually have a mineral package in them. And, and so if that consumption of that product, again, it comes back to intake, if that consumption of that product, and you're going to be supplementing any way you can do that, you're going you're to get a long ways to meet your nutrient requirement. Is it advisable to leave it a, a free choice mineral out with it? More than likely, they're going to consume that free choice mineral based on you know, it's not going to be as high consumption, but they're still going to be in there saying, okay, look, my dry matter is changing. The quality or availability of dry matter is changing. I'm eating my protein supplement and I'm going to eat some of my mineral supplement. If they're doing both, they're telling you they're still after something, right? But as far as incorporating it from an efficiency standpoint, there's no reason you can't do that. A lot of the energy supplements are hard to do that because you're dealing with such a larger intake, um, more so than you are on some of these others. So, you know, it, and, and defining what a protein supplement is versus an energy supplement. I mean, if you got something that's 18% protein, you're calling that a protein supplement. Well, there's, you know, 82% something else in there as well. And so, again, I think everybody has to understand their situation and, and how they're relating that to that intake that they're talking about. 
All right. Final question for the night. It's a little bit of a two-parter. How often should producers be refreshing their mineral? And, you know, you talked about uh, mineral going out um, and, you know, it can be contaminated certain ways or spilt. So how much should we be putting out at a time? Just so enough that our herd can eat at a, in a given amount of time or what, what would you say to that? Yeah, so that's going to depend on your logistics again, right? So if you're going to get out to these cows once a week, then you're going to put a week's worth out, right? If you can get to them every three days and you put three days worth out and those cows will tell you, you know, once they're dialed in, they'll kind of tell you where they're at and you might miss them a week or two here or there. You might be off. They might have extra. They might run out. Um, you might pull them out to go branding or you might trail to a different pasture and that might change something just because it's like, oh, there's new candy in the jar kind of thing. And, and so a lot of that just depends on your logistics of how much you put out. Now, if you're in a time of year and you're dealing with some sort of weather issue and you don't want to get a bunch of product contaminated through moisture or whatever the case may be, um, you know, you can adjust for that too. And so a lot of that just depends on your individual logistics. Now, minerals that can stand a lot of weather, you know, they can stay out there quite a while. You know, some of the larger um, yearling operations, I know that that depend on, you know, I'm not going to say a high intake mineral, but a fairly good intake mineral. Um, but they're dealing with large numbers of cattle, but they're moving them frequently. You know, they might put enough out for a week, but I mean, we're talking about delivering it in bulk kind of deal. And so they get by just fine doing that. A lot of it just depends on that operation and, and the situation. All right. Well, if uh, anyone was on that had trouble with their audio or their or their video, this rec uh, webinar was recorded. Um, it will be posted tomorrow. Just give us a little bit of time to get it uh formatted correctly to get put on YouTube. Uh, I'd like to thank Provimi again for sponsoring this webinar and Steve for you joining us and Christy as well. Greatly appreciate it. Um, I do want to remind everyone that is still on that uh, of next week's webinar of uh, enhancing beef cow reproduction through mineral supplementation with Dr. Renato Cook. Um, he will be joining us and also we uh, still have another webinar to go uh, with Trace Minerals and their role on immune response to vaccination and cattle. Um, so if you missed the first one or had trouble with the second one, please go back and watch those recordings. Um, if you typed in a question tonight that we didn't get to, I will make sure that Steve gets that um, so that he can respond to you via email. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us.